So, um, it is a great honor to introduce Dr. Alfred Lengle as the keynote speaker for this major conference. Dr. Lengle is a highly distinguished and internationally renowned figure in the field of existential psychotherapy with four decades of experience in research, training, and clinical practice. He has worked for 10 years with Viktor Frankl. Dr. Lengle, Lengle's contribution to the field of psychotherapy have been extensive and significant. He has authored and edited numerous books and articles on existential psychotherapy, and his work has been translated into many languages. In addition, he has served as the editor-in-chief of the Viennese Journal of Existential Analysis, a leading publication in the field. One of Dr. Legel's most important contribution has been the development of the theory and practice of the Viennese form of existential analysis. This approach to psychotherapy emphasizes the subjective, subjective experience of the individual and the importance of personal meaning and purpose of life. It is an integrative approach that draws on the insights of existential philosophy, psychology, and phenomenology, and has been applied successfully in a variety of clinical settings. Dr. Lengde has also made important contributions to the training and edu education of psychotherapists. He has developed a range of innovative training programs and workshops, including the Vienna Training Program in Existential Analysis. Through these programs, he and his colleagues have trained hundreds of therapists in the theory and practice of existential psychotherapy, helping to promote and disseminate this important approach to mental health and making existential analysis the biggest training center in um, Austria and having centers in about one dozen countries in Europe and the Americas. Finally, Dr. Lengle has been a strong advocate for the integration of psychotherapy and spirituality. He has written extensively on the subject, arguing that psychotherapy can help individuals to explore their spiritual dimension and find greater meaning and purpose in life. Overall, Dr. Lengle's contribution to the field of existential psychotherapy have been immense and wide-ranging. His insights, expertise, and passion for the subject make him an ideal keynote speaker for this conference. And we are honored to have him share his perspective with us. With that. Thank you, Alex Haray, Mr. Haraitis, for this lovely introduction and presentation. Thank you to the org thanks to the organizer and to Yinisti and the organizing company. It's really a great event which you brought together, and it is a sign that uh, the Greek culture is still alive and producing new events and, and new encounters. Thank you all. I have prepared a presentation which is somehow a counterweight to what Amy brought this morning. It is hmm, a bit sober. It, it, I try to, to go down, not to the underworld, but on the world, onto this earth, onto, onto this ground, and want to reflect how we can help ourselves and others to be more present, to, to improve our being here and to uh, strengthen our existence on a, uh, by, the, by the help of two tools, which I'm going to present after some first reflections. This is the agenda which I would like to go through with you in this evening. <clears throat> Just a glimpse on the background from where these reflections come. Then a foreword, prolegomena in Greece, of course, it is the Greek word. But some notes, some glimpses on, on what is the person 
and what we understand under this term, then to present a specific way of uh, helping people to be more present. The personal existential analysis, as we call it, giving an example how to apply it, so to become really practical. So I'm sorry, it's already evening, but I would like to make you work this evening before you go for Ritzina and uh, Suvlaki. Yeah. Few words on the hindrance of this, uh, of the application of this method, or what hinders us to to really be being present. And finally, a short glimpse on a, on another short method, which is very practical, very short. 10 minutes just to give another final idea how we can work. My background. This existential analysis, Vienna, Vienna style and existential analysis, is uh, uh, tries to leave, to help people to come to inner fulfillment in their life. So it's not so much symptom oriented. It's more oriented in towards the attitude to life. And the main attitude for us is to work on with the personal freedom. This is, as we could say, a prolongation of what Amy van Dersen brought this morning about freedom, a practical application of freedom. And this practicality of freedom is to look at my inner consent. Inner consent is a feeling, a sensing, is an approval that what I'm doing is um, congruent with myself. Viktor Frankl, who was my teacher, had the focus on finding meaning. We are nowadays expanding this um, approach and put it on a new basis, on a new paradigm and a phenomenological basis. And with this phenomenological approach, we found out that the, the existence is, so to say, standing on four legs, like a table, standing on four legs on this ability to, to be there, to, to be active, on the capacity to have feelings, emotions with which we can uh, find out values and be relational with the being oneself, which appears as authenticity, and to find meaning, the, the bigger context in which we are. Or in other words, it is a fourfold yes, a consent, to the facts, to the given, to life, to oneself and others, of course, in the encounter, and to the context of meaning. Now, when we speak about how can we become more present, how can I be really there? To exist means I'm there. But how can I really be there? What does this mean? What should be present? My body is there anyway. So for this, this is a constant given. I am in the world, but what does this mean, being in the world? This is, means also a being in reality, in the given, which is maybe not what I wish, what I dream of. But it's there. It's a sickness. It's uh, my pain in my physical pain, my social pain. It is my joy, my love, my, my others, but also me. I'm here and there. This being there is essential. What is the basic meaning of being born? I'm, we are there, we are here, but what for? Of course, we cannot give a general answer, but we can give an idea. The fact that I am here means something. 
it is a challenge that I should really be here, actually be here. Being in the world is a given, but to exist is not just a given. To exist, this needs me. I don't come to existence if I don't take part in this being here. If I don't commit, integrate, engage, relate, work, suffer, enjoy, taking my time. The completion of this being in the world demands an actively bringing myself into it. I have to make myself present. I'm not automatically here. Somehow, yeah, my body is there. But me, the real me, my core self, my center, needs an activity, needs a process in each situation. And not just once in a lifetime. Every hour, every moment, I have to bring myself into this world anew. I have been born once. This was thankfully done by my mother. But now I have to mother myself, to bring myself into this world again and again. Right now, for instance, when you listen, to be present means not only cognitively with the attention, but also with the heart, with the body. This uh, being present needs to be a presence in front of others, but also in front of myself. And especially, it is especially difficult when the psyche brings up its claims. Kenneth Bradford wrote that Buchenthal emphasized the practice and presence. Practice of presence, Buchenthal. Practice of presence. It was a great theme for him. And he wrote, daring to be open and responsive to an other. And I'm present. When I dare to be open and responsive, there is the theme of dialogue in it, to an other. And the willingness to trust in the mystery of being. Am I really willing to trust, to trust in something which is a mystery, as Buchenthal writes, this mystery which we call being? How can we do that? It needs my personal existence, and it needs your personal existence. It needs ourselves, our really personal given presence, capacity to resonate. The existential act of coming into real being needs this process. And the contribution of ourselves, this actively hanging our heart on what we are doing, being aware, being open, resonating, accepting, receiving, and giving back. This makes us present. And for this, we have created a method which we call personal 
existential analysis. But to know more about it, we have to have a short glimpse on what we understand with person. You may have different terms for the, but the, that what is what I'm going to describe is known to every one of, of us, of course. Person we call, it is more now a few more philosophical terms about person. The essence, that what is really me, what makes me unique, what is somehow, it's not graspable, it's not, it has no substance. It's just like a resonance in myself, a resonating self in the intersubjective exchange. Also, there is, we are breathing in our dialogue, in the encounter. More psychologically speaking, when you say, I personally, I made it personally, this was really me who said that. I'm referring to that, the authentic self. I'm authentic when I'm saying what I personally feel and think, how it comes up in me. I don't make it. I receive it from the inside. And I receive it as the true, the right, the important, the beautiful, the morally true, correct, the authentic. These are all terms referring to what we call here the person. Being a person means to be in an exchange with otherness. I cannot be myself without otherness. Being in the world. Being presupposes world. And this exchange, when this exchange is dialogical, which means essential, what you say, what I understand, what I answer, then I am present. This scheme makes it maybe a bit more visible. I, as person, am connected with my inner world. When I close my eyes, when I go to sleep, I'm with myself. I'm constantly myself. When you listen now, you are also connected with the inner world. How it is for me, what does it tell me? Is it interesting? From where do you know that? By checking the inner world. And at the same time, we are always in an outer world, which is not me. And I am in this overlap, constantly being inside and outside. This dialogical exchange means that existence is fundamentally dialogical within oneself, between oneself and others. And it is impossible to separate the individual from the world around. We belong together. And it is the person from where comes our inner consent. We don't make it, we can't conclude it logically. Inner consent means I feel, I sense a, a yes. And it is so central that we take it even as a description of existential analysis for us to help people to live according to their inner consent, to what they are doing, having a yes to the world, to the facts, to the life, to life, to themselves and others, and to the context in which we are. When we have inner consent, then this leads that we can come, this brings with it a commitment. We can dedicate ourselves. This makes me authentic. This is really me, gives me presence. 
And as a consequence, as a, as a result, it leads to fulfillment. When we don't have inner consent, when we do things, when we land ourselves, because somebody wants it from me and I do it, I obey, I, I incline, then I give myself away and void and emptiness is the result. This is the opposite. Now, how can we apply this? We said being in the world is in a constant exchange with the inner and the outer world. We are in a constant dialogue. Even when we are not speaking with other people, when we, when we make a walk, uh, we see the trees, we see the, the city, we see, we, and we are somehow dialoguing unconsciously, but we are taking it and speaking inwardly with ourselves. And dialogue has three very simple presuppositions. It needs an addressee. It needs another one who tries to understand, and it requires a response. This is the basic principle of the method, as simple as it is. So it is a method taken from the reality, from what we do every time. In a bit a changed uh, terminology, we can say this addressee must be receptive, must, must be reachable, open. The person, when we encounter a person, when we speak to somebody, seen from the outside, we can say, I, I connect with you when I see that you are looking at me, that you are listening, that you are, that, that you are ready to the message which I am going to give you. And when you try to understand what I'm saying, you make yourself even more present. And when you give me an answer, then you are fully there. It's like the phases of the moon. Half moon, full moon. The answer is the full moon. A bit more in detail. Receptivity from the scene from the outside means from the inside that people have an impression when they listen to me in an encounter, in a dialogue. And when they listen to me, I can see there is a depth which is attainable. You are, this person is approachable. It gives me the attention, basis for a dialogue. But it needs an understanding. I, when I see that you try to understand me, then you are figuring out inside an inner position. And you connect the new with the, the own, the old information. And you combine it. And so you come to understanding. It's an, a weaving together of old and new. And at the same time, a raising, a rising above the actual situation, the, the, the ongoing situation, to gain a perspective. And then finally, when you give your answer, then you bring yourself to expression. You show yourself outwardly. And you disclose yourself and say, here I am. This is how it is for me. This is my position. This conceptual framework of the personal existential analysis has as a basis, seen from the outside, these three elements, receptivity, understanding, and responsiveness. These are ways how the person I personally, I essentially can, can be seen from the outside. When you see no, when I see the other is open, tries to understand, and gives me an answer. On the inside, 
there is in the, on the level of receptivity impression when you listen you have an impression you have an impression a cognitive information of course but you have much more an impression is much broader and deeper you have a feeling you have uh, memories uh, uh, connections associations all this is in the impression you are maybe you get feelings of being bored or angry or you may feel it's interesting all this is in the, included in the impression it is a much broader information which uh, is taken up understanding means i'm preparing my position and answering means that i'm expressing you know impression expression and in between there is my taking a stand as a result to be genuinely oneself in each situation is nothing that happens automatically it's not just natural this is a, a personal you may even say spiritual mindful act and it needs me it is an endeavor and when i don't do that when i'm not bringing myself into the presence of where i am and if in 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 what i do when i fail in this then i become silent i i may feel blocked there may be a paralyzation and if this goes on and on and again and again and this is becomes a constant failure then psychopathology arises how do we apply this in short form we have four questions we first look at the facts at the given what is the situation and then we ask how is it for you we refer to the feelings more than to the thinking and what is your position and what would you do with that the description this is a gas a collecting of information about the facts of yeah let's say here i have uh, to make it more practical a person who lives alone who suffers of not having a closer relationship and who tried but then he failed and he feels single and lonely and uh, is ashamed etc and comes with this with this question so we let them describe what is going on what are the facts yeah i in the weekends i'm alone and i it's always me i'm going to restaurants and I, I, and i'm alone and my friends have partners and friendships and i'm mostly i have some school friends but i have no partner and i never had a partner what does this mean con 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 concretely to you uh, that i feel estranged this is this is something which makes me unhappy so to give him a, give the clients a chance to describe the situation means that uh, they already come to a, a first distancing to what they experience because a description makes a picture of what is going on then the work starts how is this for you this for instance living without a, having a closer relationship what feelings do you have with this reality oh i feel of course lonely i feel insecure i i feel uh, and going on to come closer to 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 the deeper feelings i feel like a little child like a young boy it was a man and what automatic impulse is accompanied the feeling or each feeling has a dynamic in it 
the dynamic is an impulse first. Oh, I want to hide myself. I want to disappear. I don't want to be, to, to be seen like that. Sometimes to run away. And what does this situation tell you? The fact that you are so alone. What is the message of this reality? He thought about it and then he said, well, I'm not grown up. I'm not uh, mature. I'm, I'm not a real adult. I'm, I'm, I'm no, I don't know if I'm really capable to, to make a living. He worked. He had a good position as a, he functioned well in our society, but inwardly he felt like that. So he has an understanding, a self-understanding of what is going on with this. Now we take the, the situation and we look what is coming from the inside. What, uh, when we reverse the situation, first it was how was the, the wave from the outside when, when he goes out and is alone. And now what is your position towards it? Then we, look for the counter-reality, cognitively, emotionally, the inner depth, we look for the inner depth. And this gives, this is a way which leads to more authenticity, to freedom and to responsible actions. So first we ask, do you understand your feelings? Do you understand that this is so in your life, in your life? Why is it alike? And he said, well, this was interesting. He quickly combined it with his mother relationship. The mother is living next to his apartment. He lives alone, but the parents live in the apartment aside. And the mother has a key to his apartment. And the mother comes into his apartment whenever she wants and doesn't even ring the bell. She just opens the apartment and steps in. And she said, well, this is somehow, I feel awkward about this, but I, I never said anything towards her because she is, of course, a very loving mother. And so, you know, this is, uh, but he connected it immediately here that his behavior, um, his being alone, is connected to a dominating, ever-present mother. And do you understand the others? Do you understand that other people do not connect with yourself? He said, of course, because the way I'm looking, this is not very attractive, and I'm... I'm insecure, timid, uh, I, I don't speak up, and I'm, I'm so shy, and this is, for me, it's natural that nobody comes up to me. I understand that. Do you feel, next question, in this context of gaining a position, a stand, do you feel that your behavior and the behavior of the others corresponds to you? That do you do justice to yourself when you behave like that. She said, no, that's not really me. I, I feel estranged. I, I somehow am not capable to stand up and to, to really show myself. I, this does not correspond to me. This is a, a strange behavior. And he feels strange. What do you think about your situation? This is now a, a, a reflection, a cognitive thinking about yourself. He said, well, this is almost maybe pathological. This is not normal. It is at least extremely timid. Bit 
cowardish, I would say. And I am, when you ask me so directly, uh, he summed it up and said, it looks like being a mommy's boy. Do you feel it needs some action from you? He said, in preparing the will, it's his own decision. And he said, yeah, I feel this no longer, as I said before, this no longer corresponds to me. This is not the way how I am and how I can be. I should do more. I should do something. I, I, I don't want to let it go as I did it before. It needs some action. Now we come to the practical part. What would you do with it? With the fact of living alone, with the fact of not being able to connect. And he said, well, what is the most important to do? He said, yeah, to go out, to meet people. And this is easily said. But how can you do that? When you imagine you go out and, and you start a talk with, with a nice girl, a nice woman, and, you, you st and she asks you, uh, are you in a relationship? Women like to ask that often at the beginning. And then he has to say, no. And then she may ask him, did you ever have a relationship or have you been in a longer relationship? And then what can I say? <laughs> we became very shy, very anxious. Well, the truth? Why not? But then all women run away. He's afraid. When, when, when she knows that I never had a relationship before. Well, yeah. So, but the truth is the truth. If you start a relationship and it will be a longer lasting relationship sooner or later, she will come, she will know that, she will get the information. So without truth, how can you build up a relationship? This was a bit difficult for him to stand by himself, behind himself and to, to let him be seen because his reflex, his impulse was to run away and to hide. And now he had to realize that he has to be himself, to make himself more present in his life. With whom would you like to do that? He said, maybe I can ask, I have two school friends, maybe I can go out with them sometimes or so, to, to not be too alone. When would you like to start? He said, well, as soon as possible, this weekend I could start. And how would you like to do it? And then he, he reflected again and said, maybe I, I can go to, to this. There is a group of people who are uh, fascinated by uh, hiking in the, Alp, in the Alps. And I go into this group and I go with them and for, for hiking. And this is a good opportunity to meet people and to come to talk with other people. And he did it. This was just two sessions we worked on that. And he managed it to do it according to this with his friends and then, and then alone in the hiking group. And, and he made himself present in his life. So this was a simple example. Of course, we can do much more complicated situations and work them through with this method. There is a chain when I can be myself and show me and be present, then I reach you. And this is also going on. You will be more present. And this gives me more presence. And this is the chain of true, authentic conversation dialogue. And this is the basis for psychological health when we can be, to realize this potential which is in us to make our essence, our person, to make ourselves personally present, then we can be authentically present in the situation. There are hindrances, of course, in all these uh, 
steps. There can be hindrances after the impression the, that the impression doesn't go over to a real finding a position or when we have a position that it is difficult to give it an, an appropriate expression or in the execution of the expression, in the, in the doing that we are blocked and just to give some ideas, this is maybe not the central theme for now, but the impression that one can be confused, overwhelmed by feelings and hurts and anxious and too, it may be too painful or the inner position that one may be feel alienated and blurred, exerted or in the expression that one may be strained, anxious in showing oneself. I give you now just to give you an idea, a synopsis. You see here again, the first working through the psychodynamics by looking at the feelings, the understanding of the content. Then we have the next step, the positioning. That this was what I showed you in this little example and constructing a, or finding a will and then to accommodate to reality. In when we do psychotherapeutic work in with people who are really suffering from problems, from hurtings, from traumas, then it becomes more complicated. Just to give you an idea that there is much more behind, I showed you a very simple way, a way uh, how we can apply it in, in a counseling in, and very quickly. But when the, comp the, the complexity is higher, we need a more de a deeper work, or it may look like this. And so on, you see. Yeah. I would like to come to the, an other method the personal positioning, which is we take out the, let's say, the top of the, the triangle and work only with positioning. This is can be done especially in counseling work. It doesn't go so deep, but it is very practical and helpful in feelings of powerlessness and passivation. A, confronting irrational beliefs, everybody must love me, otherwise I'm not lovable, etc. irrational beliefs, anxieties, depressive thoughts, and crisis. To gain more presence, this can be achieved by three times taking a position. Very simple, again, a position towards the outside a position towards the inside, and a position to the content, to the value, to the positive. Position towards the outside. You see, I, the person, am confronting the threatening world with all these influences upon me, and I now try to determine facts. For instance, a classical situation, fear of an exam. Position towards the outside. To go to the exam, what is threatening me? Look at the reality. What is threatening me? Well, you never know. It can always happen something. This is blurring, you know, anxiety uh, or also depressive feelings. Uh, I'm not worthy, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, etc. They uh, have so generalized uh, um, um, opinions, views that you cannot really grasp it. And then, of course, it remains and it grows and it becomes more pathological. Have a close look at it. You go to the exam. What is so difficult? What is... Okay. Okay, thank you. What is threatening you? What is the danger? Is it the professor? 
is this professor such a terrible person, incalculable? Is it is this uh, the, the situation that there are many people listening when you go to the exam? What is the threat? Say, listen, do say, do something. Or is it that you may have not learned enough? Yeah, this can be the case, of course. If you did not learn enough, then you know that the chance to pass the exam is lower. This is a fact. Take the facts. It is your decision to go to the exam with this level of knowledge which you have. What is the real danger? Look at the reality and take your position towards the outside and determine, yeah, I didn't learn enough, I know that, and I'm ready to undergo that risk to maybe not pass the exam and to have to sit it again, but I'm ready to do that. This is the reality. And I don't have to feel, to, to, to feel any fear because this is reality. And, or for instance, this professor is so incalculable. He sometimes has outbursts and is, uh, uh, is uh, shouting and this will be intimidate, can intimidate me. Yeah, this can be so. You have to, if it is so, you have to count with it. Look at the reality. And this is calming us so much when we know what is the reality. Fear is me, always there, chimeres or phantasmas of, of what can happen. Then position towards the inside. This is a bit tricky, but I think, I think it's, very existential to ask yourself or to ask the client, well, if it happens that you don't pass the exam, would you be able to bear it, to take it, to be with it, or would it kill you? Normally, People say, no, it would not kill me, but I don't like it. I don't want to have it. But it is impossible to live against reality. It can happen. Possibilities are almost realities, close to realities. It can happen. And just because I don't like it, this is not enough strength to, to uh, counter this possibility. I have to, to, to take it. And this is mostly, most of the work to make people aware that they can be with it if it happens in this next exam. Not always, but just for this next exam. If you don't pass, could you be with it? Can you set yourself up? Can you face? Can you, do you see do you have enough power? Of course, you don't like it. This is, this is no doubt about that. But it will not, go into, it will not kill killing you. You will survive. If you find that you are capable to bear it, and most situations we can bear it, then we still need the existential step, the specific step. Okay, you checked, you have the capability, but are you ready to do it? Do you agree? Can you say yes? This time I don't have to pass. Of course I would love to pass, but if I don't pass, because I know there are incalculable elements in the world outside, or I may, uh, may not be fit enough and, and forget things. And if, if I don't pass, this time it's no catastrophe because I know I can live with that. I can be with that. Position towards the inside. We are sometimes the biggest enemy for ourselves. 
when we have expectations, and when we don't fulfill our expectations, then we destroy ourselves, and then the rumination comes up, etc. Then, third step, position towards the positive. Joining in to the value. Why are you doing this exam? You do the exam not because you are eager to do to, 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 to make exams or to do exams. No, you are studying because you are interested in something. What is the interesting? And the positive is in the exam, you only have to say what comes into your mind. You don't have to say more, but you don't remember. You don't have to say that. L let it go. Say what comes into your mind. If this is enough or not, this is not your job. This is for this we have the professor. So this is also, you know, a, a bringing down into reality, into the given, into this world, into the, the factuality. My being here. It makes me more present as the one who I am. In on that level of development where I am right now, with all the limitations which also belong to our existence. To summarize in simple words, these three steps position towards the outside means determining what is real, what are the facts, what I have to count with, and what is still open. Second step towards the inside, adapting to my own abilities and to reconnect with my power, with my energy. And the third, adding oneself to the value of the situation. This is the real theme why I am doing the things. It's, it's not, I don't live to pass exams. I live because I'm interested in this field, in this area. Behind this, this is my last slide, is the idea of the person. With we, we, the, what is very personal, what every human being has, as is, not has, is in an unconfoundable way, which says this is our intimacy, our most intimate being with ourselves. And Khalil Gibran once wrote a phrase which I think describes pretty well this dignity. The person is the source or the reason for the fact that we give, we see in the human being, the human being in a dignity. And he writes, and I think this is applicable for psychotherapy. Spare me from any philosophy that does not cry. And spare me from any wisdom that does not laugh. It makes it so human. And spare me from any greatness that does not bow to the beauty of a child. Thank you for your attention.